All right, so hi everybody. This uh, my name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today. And as once again, as you know, once per week, I've gathered together uh, a team of space science journalists here on the Google Pluses, where we're going to talk a, about a weekly roundup of the cool space and astronomy news that have broke this week, and try and give you more insight, more analysis, and just general foolishness. So, so this week on the agenda, we've got. Uh, a lost text file. Um, so we've got uh, a star, a planet that is boiling away from its uh, from its star. Uh, we've got the the refreshed version of the Pillars of Creation. Um, we've got a galaxy composed entirely of dark matter. We've got the return of the Phobos grunt, and we've got plans to build a telescope the size of the Earth to directly image a black hole. All right, well, so I think we'll start then with uh, Dr. Phil... P oh, actually, I should introduce all my people. Oh, my God, what? I should. I need a list of things to do. Okay. Bad host. So, again, bad host. <laughs> again, I am going to be introducing these people uh, from the way I see them, which may be completely mixed up from the way you see them. So we've got Alan Boyle from MSNBC's Cosmic Log, snowed in... Right, in from the frozen Seattle. wastes of Seattle. From the frozen wastes <laughs> of Seattle. You guys got about a foot of snow, didn't you? Uh, it seemed like a foot. I think it was more like six inches, but yeah, it, it was a yard, <laughs> a, yard, a, yard. <laughs> a meter. Yeah, new ice age. Uh, Emily Lakdawalla from Planetary Society, who is working on, she's knitting right now. And <laughs> it's not knitting, it's plastic canvas. It's more like needlepoint. It's plastic <laughs> canvassing. She's needlepointing. Uh, but we'll show you the cool results of, of what she's working on. Uh, we've got John Boise, the angry astronomer. We've got uh, Nancy Atkinson, the senior editor at Universe Today. There's Hello. Matt. There's Matt. Everyone say hi to Matt. The guy hi, Matt. On my, hi, uh, Matt. On my lights. He can't hear you. Um, <laughs> Nicole Gallucci, the noisy astronomer. Uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast and a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And, of course, last but not least, Dr. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer. Why does it always put you at the end on my list? Anyway. Uh, alphabetical? Let's see. B, Maybe. L, C. Mm. No, John no. would be last, no. right? No. No, I'm always last, last. Yeah. alphabetically. <laughs> anyway, so that's the team. Uh, well, let's get cracking. Uh, I promise silliness. All right, so let's start with Phil. Uh, so you've got a story this week that you just posted about a planet getting boiled away by its star. Yeah, this was really cool. It's been a, a pretty big month or so for Exoplanet News. There's been planets found around binary stars. There have been uh, uh, planets smaller than the Earth found. All kinds of crazy stuff. One with rings. And, and this one, which was not announced at the American Astronomical Society meeting, but a, a preprint showed up on uh, the preprint server, which means, you know, when you write a paper, a journal paper, you can, once it gets accepted by the journal, you can publicize it online. And uh, Dan Vergano from USA Today tweeted about it. That's how I saw it. And I know uh, Emily tweeted about it as well. And when I saw this, I couldn't believe it. This is a, it's the planet that was found by Kepler. And Kepler is an observatory in space that is staring at one part of the sky. And what it's looking for is for a planet to pass between us and the star. When it does that, it blocks the light from the star. And you see that as a little dip in the starlight. And the bigger the planet, the bigger the dip. So there's a lot of stuff you can tell, like how close it is to the star, how big the planet is. If you know what kind of star it is, you can tell how hot the planet is, too. There's a lot of stuff you can figure out from this. Now, I have to, I have to read this because it's a, it's a mouthful. The star in this case is called KIC, which stands for Kepler Input Catalog, one of the stars that we're looking at. It's KIC 1255-57548. Trips right off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, it's 1,500 light years away. It's a long way away. It's a little bit smaller and cooler than the sun. And by cooler, I mean it's still, still several thousand degrees. It's still a very hot object. It's just a little bit cooler than the sun. Now, what they found was a dip in the light from the star that was occurring about every 16 hours or so, 15 point, like, 6, 8, 5 hours, to be precise. And uh, the dip, usually, when a planet goes between us and the star, the dip stays the same. The planet is just passing in front of the star, so the, the, the amount of starlight blocked is the same because the planet's not changing. But what they found with this one is that every single time this happened, it was different. Sometimes 1% of the starlight was blocked, sometimes none. And because of the period, they could calculate, and this is amazing, that the planet that must be doing this 
is less than, uh, I'll use English units because it sounds cooler, is less than a million miles from the surface of the star. It's wow. 900,000 miles above the surface of the star. It's amazing. Now, I've got a, uh, I've got a volleyball star model of science I've, I've, here. I've screenshared, and I've also Bill, got screenshared to, that picture. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's even cooler. Yeah, so you could, <laughs> yeah that yeah. picture is, is, so is phenomenal. It's by uh, Inga Nielsen, who is a space artist uh, in Europe, and, and um, she has this up on DeviantArt. And uh, it was up on APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day, and all over the web. And uh, it's an amazing picture. Uh, it's not new, and it's not, it's not for this uh, story particularly, but it's gorgeous, and I, I wanted to use it. Um, but imagine now, can you, can you go back to me here, Fraser? I can. It's back to you. Is it? Yeah, it's just not, I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm just oh, there not. we go. Now I see yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. It's okay, the you never see I yourself, me. Though. I don't see myself. That's right. Uh, the reason I want it on me is because I've got now the a, a volleyball representing the star. Let me get the uh, brand name off there. So, so the star is actually an, an, an orangish star. So this isn't too far off. And you can imagine that this is the planet. If this this is not to scale, I mean the star is huge and the planet is tiny. It's about the size half the size of the Earth. If this were the Earth and this were the Sun, this would be about 25 meters away, 25 yards away, outside my house. This planet, though, is orbiting so close that it's actually about, well, about this far away from the star. It's incredible. It's circling the star every 16 hours, and it passes between us and the star. And when it does that, blocks a little starlight, and so you see a dip in the light. Well, uh, this planet, because of the period, and they know the planet's so close, the planet itself, if it's made of rock, must be boiling hot, 2,000 degrees Celsius, 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the planet is literally boiling under the heat of this star. And they know that because, uh, well, because of the temperature, but also because of the changing amount of light that gets blocked from the star every time. They think that the planet must be enshrouded in a, basically a, a halo of this boiling, vaporized rock, which is incredible. And this puts an upper limit on the size of the planet, because if the planet were as big as the Earth, its gravity would be strong enough that uh, uh, the vapor wouldn't be able to escape. So the fact that there is a cloud of, of, of basically hot rock vapor around the planet means the planet must be smaller than the Earth. Also, if it were as big as the Earth or, or, or bigger, they would see always uh, some dip in the light. There would always be enough planet blocking the light that they'd see it. The fact that they don't, the fact that the amount of light block changes, the temperature of this planet, all of this stuff adds up to the idea that we have a planet literally vaporizing as it's orbiting its star. It's amazing. I got nothing. <laughs> the, the one can't thing add anything to that? I can't. When, when he gave No, the that distance? was a mouthful, man. That was awesome. When he I, gave I mean, except for the... I, of course I got something. I always have something. <laughs> So, so when he when he gave the distance, that the thing is, this is like four times She's the distance huge, between uh, the Earth and the Moon. So yeah, it's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the when you look at the Earth, the Earth and the Sun, uh, it, the the Earth, uh, the Moon is uh, a certain distance from the Earth. It's four hundred thousand kilometers, two hundred eight thousand miles. Yeah. The Sun is four hundred times farther away from us than the Moon is. Okay, this planet is four times farther away from its star than the moon is from the Earth. It's incredibly, yeah. incredibly close. It is basically skimming the surface of a star. Um, now, I, I, on, on top of all this, as a scientist, I have to say, look, the, the, the existence of this planet is not 100% confirmed. However, they have they worked really hard in the paper. The paper's online. Um, and they, okay. Alan. Man, I'm tired. My dogs are barking. Um, we're, we're taking care of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, these, are, these are observations from Kepler, uh, which means they're pretty good. We have hundreds of other planets that have been detected this way. I, I read the, uh, the journal paper, and, and I've got to say, as a scientist, it looks, I was going to say it looks pretty solid to me. It actually looks pretty, pretty liquid to me. Um, but it's actually, it actually looks like a pretty, pretty good result. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's amazing. And the thing is, we will find more things like this. The very first planet detected using this transit method of, of passing between us and the star, HD 209458b, also is so close to its star that it's losing its atmosphere. It's all puffed up. But that's basically a gas giant. This is a, a planet that probably used to be solid, moved in closer to its star, and is now boiling away. And I, I suspect we will find more of these as time goes on. 
One now, the rest I of you talk a lot more about stars than I do, and I'm wondering if you get tired of naming stars by these letter and number combinations. Do you wish that the stars had <laughs> proper names like the planets do? It's a great name. HD 209458, KIC, blah, 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 blah. Hey, you've got plenty of minor planet categories that are year, number, slash, something, something. <laughs> so we, we don't own the awful names. <laughs> yeah, and, and let's let's put this in perspective, right? Or even the extrasolar planets are all designated. Yeah, and, and you, let's put it in perspective, right? There are thousands of asteroids, and we're running out of names. Yes. Okay, Kepler is looking at a hundred thousand stars. So if you want to sit there and name them all, they haven't I'm run sure, out of I'm names until sure they name one after me. As you can see, there's Emily Lochtawalla one, Emily Lochtawalla two. <laughs> hey, I'm right there, Emily. You and I can be in the No Asteroid Club together. That's right. Yeah. Nobody wants to pronounce I, my name. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I feel. Like, I, I guess people don't know. Phil and I have asteroids named after us. Yeah, Sorry, yours guys. Is bigger than mine, though, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> I think so. Man. But who has the lower number? Because they are the cooler one. That's right. It's like a <laughs> Kevin Bacon number. Yeah. <laughs> I think Asteroid um, Boyle has a lower number, but I, I think it was named after a different Boyle. Oh, was it? Okay. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, right, so and let's, let's move on. I want to move on. I want to move on. We're running out of time. Oh, sorry. I went on too long. Sorry. That's okay. It's all right. Um, right, okay. So I guess what I wanted to talk about next was the fact that, that they've released a brand new, way nicer version of the Pillars of Creation, the Nebula. And uh, Alan, you you uh, reported on this, and I'm going to put up the picture so people yeah. can see it while you talk. I would question whether it's way nicer. It it, it is mind-boggling, but uh, I think there's something iconic about the Pillars of Creation image that Hubble came up with in uh, 1995, uh, and and so uh, there have been other views of these pillars, which are part of the Eagle Nebula uh, in Serpens, and uh, so. The first picture kind of showed these fingers of gas and dust reaching up, and you could imagine the star systems being formed within them. Uh, and so these pictures look more at the structure of it, and, and some pictures can look inside uh, the clouds of dust using infrared wavelengths. Uh, other pictures look at the star cluster that is uh, kind of creating all this uh, violence and star creation and destruction. And so this picture uh, actually combines uh, all, a lot of facets. It's a multi-wavelength composite that, uh, that relies upon uh, far infrared uh, wavelengths as well as from the uh, Herschel Space Observatory by the European Space Agency, as well as the uh, XMM Newton uh, X-ray probe. And so uh, one of the interesting things about this is that it's a wider angle view of the locale. And so I think for some people, it's even a little bit difficult to figure out where the pillows are in this picture. And, and we've had people write in and say, oh, I see a monk praying in a monastery. Uh, other people say, oh, there's a dog in there. It's a devil. Uh, all sorts of folks can <coughs> see what's in the cloud. But the, the point of the pictures is to get a fuller perspective of uh, what's going on with the Pillars of Creation, which is one of the closer uh, cradles of star birth that we know of. And uh, we can see uh, which of these cradles have kids in them, which have infant stars, and which don't. And we're starting to really get a picture of what the mechanism is for, for star birth and, and how uh, blasting stars, the radiation from star clusters, and perhaps a supernova that's blasting away can create a new generation of stars. And so there's something philosophical about that as well, uh, that death gives birth to uh, the new generation. Uh, and in fact, speaking of death, uh, the common thinking is that the pillars of creation have already been destroyed, that because of a supernova that went off in that star cluster, uh, the uh, pillars couldn't stand up to the blast of radiation from that supernova. But we're seeing the pillars uh, as they were 6,500 years ago, and we figure in another 500 years or so, that shock wave from the supernova is going to reach the pillars and blast them into smithereens. But could, could you write a follow-up article then? <coughs> yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> so check back with me in 500 years or so. After he joins the singularity. <laughs> <laughs> my my, my uh, android will uh, take care of that for me. 
<laughs> That's good. No, I, 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 I apologize to Hubble for, for calling this a way cooler picture. I agree. The uh, original Pillars is good, but I, I do like the wider view, and I do like... I mean, I guess a lot of people don't realize that when you see a lot of these pictures, when they do bring together multiple telescopes, they'll use one telescope for one color and then a different telescope for a different color and then sort of blend it all together. So as always, you're not seeing the true color of what this this nebula oh, is sure. going to look like. It's it's completely, you know, it's more about the science than it is actually about what the image looks like, but it still does look... But that, that's the beauty of having multiple telescopes look at these things, is that you really do get a fuller picture, a fuller spectrum, literally, uh, what's going on. And so we're seeing more and more of that. And so you might see the same scene from different telescopes, and you might wonder, well, been there, done that, but uh, really, you're adding a new dimension with each uh, instrument that's looking at it in a different wavelength. And, and that's the fantastic thing about modern astronomy is that we have so many instruments that are able to produce a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. All right, well, Nancy, you wanted to talk about a galaxy composed entirely out of dark matter. Yeah. Well, one kind of problem in galactic astronomy is that astronomers think that the Milky Way should have more satel uh, smaller satellite galaxies that uh, bigger galaxies like the Milky Way or, or larger should have um, uh, like about 10,000 satellite galaxies around us, but um, uh, we've only observed about 30 so far. So a group of astronomers decided to look and see if they could see some of these satellite galaxies or dwarf galaxies around other galaxies to kind of compare to the Milky Way. Um, and so far they haven't had too much luck. Um, so the thinking was that either these dwarf galaxies aren't there, uh, there's not that many, or that they're, we can't see them, meaning that they don't have very many stars, or that they could be made exclusively of dark matter. But there was one group of astronomers that kind of hit paydirt in this area using the Keck 2 telescope on Mauna Kea. They looked at a very distant elliptical galaxy and saw an unusual ring around it, which meant that they were seeing a gravitational lens effect, uh, meaning that there was some object in the way kind of blocking some of the light. So for gravitational lensing, imagine that I'm a bright galaxy, and, um, and you guys are the telescope on Earth, and uh, imagine that there was, uh, you know, if there's nothing in between me, the galaxy, and you on Earth, then you can see me just fine. However, if there's something in between, um, then you're going to have uh, trouble seeing it, and actually the light around uh, coming from me, coming around this, this uh, other object, will be bent, and that causes a gravitational lens. Um, uh, and in this case, they were seeing a ring around this galaxy, which is called an Einstein ring. Uh, but they really weren't able to see any light from this object in between, and so they deduced that it was a dwarf satellite galaxy, and uh, they were able to kind of deduce from all the data they were getting from this ring that it was about uh, 200 million times the mass of the sun, which is similar to the masses of satellite or dwarf galaxies that we have around the Milky Way. And uh, so they think that this tiny galaxy is made almost completely of dark matter with hardly any stars um, since they can't see it. And so the only way that they were able to see it was because of this Einstein ring? Yes. So, to be so clear, they know it's there. Fraser, that image you put up, the ring, is that a model or was that the actual observation? Does anybody know? I know. I got that from the story, Nancy. Was that from yeah, the that's, actual observation? Yeah, that's, that's from the Keck telescope. Okay. It's that, that's, the a model of, that's a model of the distribution of the dark matter based on the observed lensing of the galaxies. So, so the idea is that if you look at a whole bunch of galaxies, some of them will be oriented like this, some will be like this, some will be like this. And if you average together all those crazy alignments, you always get a perfect circle. But if you instead see some weird mutant teardrop drop shape, that's because there's intervening gravity that is bending everything all to, to heck. Um, you can backwards compute what that mass must be to get the distortion observed. And by doing that backwards, what must we be looking at, they were able to figure out the distribution for the dwarf galaxy. But in most cases, in most situations where we get these Einstein rings, you've got a, you've got a galaxy up front that you can see, and then a, another image of the galaxy that's behind, and you can see both of them. But, I, but in this situation, there's like no galaxy in front that you could see. 
just the right. just the the distorted gravitational light from the the galaxy behind. That's right. really cool. So so what would be a process that would cause a a galaxy entirely made of dark matter? Does anybody know? Dark matter halos forming. Um, mm -hmm. If it's too small, it won't collect. Uh, I think this is uh, as these are collapsing and forming um, like baby proto galaxies. If it doesn't have enough dark matter in it, it won't attract enough normal matter, uh, and so you don't get stars and gas and things that we see um, with the normal electromagnetic spectrum. That's one oh. idea. How and can work. you get those situations where gal I know galaxies can collide and kind of strip the they can, they can, two galaxies can collide. They can strip. They can, you know, the the matter collects together, but the the dark matter halos go away, mm -hmm. and you can have one of those just moving through the universe. Well, no, no, no. It doesn't actually work like that. So, so the dark matter will originally pass through each other. So will the stars. So will the, galaxies, the gas yeah. collects in the center. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. But so as they pass separate. back and forth, you eventually end up with all the luminous matter, gas, stars, all of it in the center, and all of the dark matter in the center. It's just a matter of how many crossings does it take to get it's everything settled into the center? Yeah. Right. Well, I wonder, you know, if, if two small galaxies collide quickly enough, they won't be gravitationally bound. They'll just pass through each other. If it's early and enough that there aren't stars in it? Yeah, but the, star, the, stars will, the stars won't collide, so they'll keep moving. The gas clouds, the normal this matter the gas case, clouds... Yeah, this will, is the will, case of galaxy harassment, not merger. Right. So they, they okay. slam into each other. The dark matter passes right through because it's not made of normal matter. The, the gas clouds, the normal matter gas clouds, stop dead. And so everything, you know, everything's, the, the dark matter keeps going. The normal matter stops. The stars keep going because they don't actually hit each other. They're too small. Um, but if you do that early enough in the life of a galaxy, um, I can imagine there may not be enough stars that have formed so that there, there may be normal stars in this galaxy. It's a long way off, right? So there yeah. may be normal stars, we just don't see them. Uh, and so there's, there's, um, it's mostly dark matter. Or, like Nicole said, maybe this is like just condensed dark matter uh, from the early universe. It just wasn't enough, didn't have enough oomph to draw in enough normal matter to form a, a normal galaxy. Uh, either way, this is really cool. I, I like what Nicole said a lot, because that means that there's sort of an, uh, a lower limit of dark matter you need to make a galaxy. Mm -hmm. And every time we observe something like this, that helps us sort of nail down what you need. It's like, oh, here's one that doesn't have any normal matter, but we know how much dark matter it has. So we know we need more than that to make a galaxy. And every time you do that, that helps you understand how to make a galaxy. So that's pretty, that's pretty slick. I like that. And, and in general, dwarf galaxies have the highest ratio of dark matter to luminous matter. We, we see this when we look at the nearby ones that just barely show up as a few hundred so stars much, over yeah. density yeah. in the sky. That's really cool. Um, all right, well, so we're going to move to Emily now, and she's going to talk about the return of Phobos grunt finally, which we've been predicting here on the show week after week. Uh, but before she does, Emily, you've got to show us your, what you're working on. This is really cool. Um, well, right now, what I'm working on right now doesn't look like a whole lot, but it's going to be one of these guys. Here's, an exa here's my first effort to create out of uh, yarn and needle and plastic canvas a spacecraft. This one is Dawn, um, because I had a Dawn model that I needed to use last week. Here's a, this is the framing cameras. This is the visual infrared spectrometer. Here are the three ion engines. Um, here is the uh, high gain antenna, which I now know is the wrong color. I have to change that. And there's the <laughs> low gain antenna. <laughs> take it apart. Um, oh, it won't, it won't take much. Just a pair of scissors, and I'll be able to replace it. And then uh, just yesterday, in honor of New Horizons' sixth launch day, which is today, um, we have here New Horizons. A little triangular spacecraft spinning right now in space. Ooh, that looks like somewhat cool. like a lemon. So this <laughs> is going on Etsy? Is this something um, you're going to... I think I, I, if I get motivated, I'm going to make some patterns and, and possibly even kits and, and sell them on Etsy. Yeah. Yay. We'll put it on Pinterest. Yeah. Put it on Ravelry. Um, right now, uh, uh, <laughs> this is going to be the solar panel for Grail. Cool. You, you, that's already half finished from when you started the show. <laughs> well, not half finished, but yeah, I've made progress. It's a, it's a quick medium. Anyway, Phobos Grunt um, came down on Sunday morning, and I have to say a big thank you to Phil for inviting me to participate in the Google Hangout, kind of an impromptu one in the morning, um, uh, along with my, my children who <laughs> occasionally <laughs> appeared on the screen. 
Um, so yeah, Phobos Grunt finally came to the ground. Um, there was a very fast announcement by the Russian military that it came down in the Pacific Ocean about, uh, they said, 1,250 kilometers off the west coast of Chile, which was awfully specific. Um, and as it turns out, that um, uh, that report was based on their models. It was not actually based on any radar detection of the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And so um, the models actually allow quite a long range of possible reentry locations for Phobos Grunt. It could have landed at that location in the Pacific. It's actually probably the most likely location, but it also could have landed anywhere over a wide swath of South America on up even into the Western Atlantic Ocean. So. Um, I suppose there's still a chance that somebody could find some bits of it, notably the sample return capsule, which would contain the Phobos, um, the life experiment that the Planetary Society provided to it. But uh, um, it's, it's down, the mission's over, and um, I think it's time to move on to the active and successful Mars missions. And did you predict where it was going to fall, Phil? Me? Yeah, didn't you predict the Pacific Ocean? Oh, that. Uh, yeah. That, but that, that's, that's only marginally more specific. Yes. Yeah, it's marginally more specific than saying it's going to fall to the Earth. You know, the, the in water ocean is a yeah. huge amount of, of real estate. And, and so, you know, chances are if it's going to fall anywhere, it's going to fall over water. And if it's going to fall over water, it's going to fall over the Pacific Ocean. No, Phil, you're psychic. Just yeah. go with it. I think it's no. worth mentioning that, a Rus that another Russian spacecraft act actually fell to Earth um, just two days later, one that was supposed to, f you know, is an old, an old defunct spacecraft. So these kinds of things actually happen all the time. It's not very common that they get the kind of worldwide attention that this one did, or you are Zerosat. It's actually very, um, a very common occurrence for spacecraft to come down, and they, so far, cross your fingers, they have not actually landed on anybody. Um, and done any harm to any humans. Um, there are occasionally bits of Russian spacecraft, uh, particularly like uh, fuel tanks, spherical fuel tanks that are found on the ground um, in different locations. But for the most part, they, uh, they fall where nobody sees them. Is that those, those metal balls that people are, are turning up around the world? Yeah. There's a little bit of controversy that's continuing over uh, the sp satellite data, the reentry data that uh, there's a site called Space Track that is supposed to provide coordinates on, on satellites like Phobos Grunt, and uh, they don't, they kind of removed the uh, data for Phobos Grunt, and so people are wondering whether there's some sort of cover up or, or what's going on. But uh, hopefully, uh, the European Space Agency apparently is trying to put together some of the uh, calculations on where reentry occurred, and hopefully, there will be a little bit of closure in the next couple of days on this. But a Emily is right that we should probably get on to missions that are actually working. <laughs> well, no, it's good, it's good to sort of see every stage of this. And in the end, I mean, it's really sad that the mission didn't do what it was going to do. I mean, that's sort of the, the part that's really sad. So hopefully there'll be some other mission that will fill in. Do you know if there's any plans to, to redo it? Um, well, of course, the science team would love to redo it. Um, I doubt that it will get redone in its in the form that it finally took because it was kind of an, it was an enormous spacecraft with a, with too many instruments that wound up having to strap on extra fuel tanks. It was just too big. Um, and so hopefully somebody with a little bit more control over what all the scientists want to do will be, uh, get the Russians going on to another Mars mission sometime in the future. But I, you know, the next big, th big thing is, of course, Curiosity landing in April. Um, and hopefully someday ESO will get their ExoMars rover off the ground. But that, of course, always keeps on getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And so you don't really know when that's going to launch either. All right, well, Pamela, I think the, the last uh, story that we've got scheduled here is the uh, plans to develop an Earth-sized telescope to image a black hole. But I'm sure that's not exactly what the story <laughs> is, is it? Well, it, it's more a matter of uh, combining a bunch of existing telescopes into one light-collecting instrument and achieving high enough resolution that we can see the exact point where you go from stars acting like normal stars and light acting like normal starlight to the event horizon having all sorts of neat, nifty, awesome effects. So the idea here is one that we've been using for a number of years. It's to take uh, radio telescopes, in this case ones that look in the colors of light not too different from what you use to nuke your food in a microwave and point all of the world's appropriately wavelength submillimeter and milli millimeter telescopes at the center of our galaxy, at an object that we refer to as Sag A star. And 
by combining all of their light, we are able to increase the resolution. Um, telescopes don't care if you remove chunks from the mirror. It just means you collect less light. What matters is how big is that mirror um, for the resolution you get. If you have a little tiny telescope, you can't see a lot of details because the number of wavelengths that fit across the collection area aren't that great. And that's where your resolution comes from. It gets into all sorts of crazy quantum mechanics. If I take two telescopes, move them apart, point them at the same object, and combine the light through a process called interferometry, I get the equivalent of a telescope the same size as a telescope that has a diameter of the separation between those two telescopes. Now, our planet Earth currently defines the maximum resolution we can get because we don't have the right type of orbiting telescopes. But they've put together a network of telescopes that allows them to basically get either side of the planet looking in the same direction at the same time with a variety of telescopes in the middle. They're going to try and figure out how to point all these telescopes at the same time at Sag A star. And they will have sufficient resolution that if they wanted to, they could make out the equivalent of an orange sitting on the surface of the moon. Now, that's the type of resolution that's needed to make out the event horizon of our own Milky Way galaxy's central supermassive black hole. This is a black hole that's about 4 million solar masses in size. We can actually see stars orbiting it at distances not too different from Pluto orbiting our own sun. But we want to get down to the event horizon. And that's a distance of about Mercury's orbit around the sun. And they're going to try and do that. And right now, it's just the politics and technology sorting. This is the, the scientific equivalent of, do we use OS X or Windows when you're trying to figure out a collaboration? They're going to figure it out. And we're going to get pretty awesome results that just 20 years ago, we couldn't have imagined. Now, do you need to, to, to watch it as materials being gobbled up? Or is it just being able to see those stars orbit around it? Well, the thing is, you can look at the background light. And by looking at how the background light gets affected as it fails to pass through the event horizon, that's what points you at where the telescope is. So this is actually kind of awesome that there isn't the accretion disk, because the accretion disk would blind us from being able to make out any details of, of the supermassive black hole and its event horizon. Without that accretion disk, we just look at how background light gets bent. This that's group's really cool. been um, testing this with various submillimeter telescopes for a few years, and they yeah. did one where they connected just three telescopes, which isn't enough to make a really good image, or an image at all, um, but they started to make these measurements, and they've been modeling, they look like these, I, I don't have a picture to show, to link, but they look like these funky, you know, rings all distorted, and you can tell something about, rel you know, relativity from the shape of the funky distorted light around the black hole. And, and the reason that they're doing this in the millimeter and the submillimeter is the, the shorter the wavelength of light you get, the finer the details you can look at. But the problem that we run into is once you start getting into optical light, optical light you have to combine in real time. You have to take the light from the two telescopes, funnel it down to fiber optic, mix it together, getting all of the separations correct. It's hard. We aren't good at doing this with optical light. Those people but are ninjas. They, they are. They <laughs> are. But in the radio, you record it to tape, and you mix it in the computer processors. This was actually my high school job, was working to do this for the very large oh. array. Um, some things, you just get lucky because you record things to tape, and you process it later. And this is one of those times you get lucky. Do they still really use tape? No. Um, some of them do. No, <laughs> okay, some good. of them do. The they, still have they have a software correlator now. Right. But for some of the two, two telescopes yeah. around the world, this is where they still have the Mark V at Haystack Observatory. Oh, oh, so, yeah. so this that stuff still does there. come into play. And, and yeah. Nicole and I have both worked at Haystack, just separated oh. by about a decade. Pamela, you said uh, they're not going to be using any space telescopes for this, but I know that previously, uh, in 1997, uh, the Japanese launched a radio telescope, Halka, that did uh, space very long baseline interferometry, and they'd actually image the accretion disk around black holes in other galaxies. I don't think that spacecraft is still uh, functional, but somebody was asking also in the comments, what about spacecraft like uh, Spectre-R, which is a radio telescope in orbit? 
they do have them, but they're really low sensitivity. Yeah. The longer baseline you have, the less well you know the position, because it's not grounded on Earth, it's in orbit. You've got to know that position to within millimeters or smaller. Yeah. Um, so the sensitivity isn't terribly good on those. Your um, positional accuracy has to be as good as your wavelength. Yeah. And when something's orbiting, it's moving awful fast, and it gets a lot, lot harder. But you can imagine a far future if this <coughs> is somewhat successful that they can even plan missions that would put radio telescopes on opposite sides of the Earth's uh, orbit. And uh, you'd want to put it on the moon, put it on a rock. Yes. Right. But an Earth-Moon baseline would be awesome. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That, that <laughs> is something I think all of us want. It's yes. just a matter of where on the moon do you put it. And then build a telescope the actual size of the Earth. <laughs> I've uh, yeah, heard I don't of people know talking about doing that on the moon. a whole lot better. Well, tear apart the Earth, of course. Let's all just take... Uh, but I've heard of people talking about doing that on the moon, using the shape of the craters to help uh, build the kind of shape of the telescope. Yeah. And well, that's what they did at Arecibo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Exactly what they did. And yeah. one of the awesome things about the moon, um, there, there's research being done down at the University of Tennessee, or Tennessee University, I'm never sure which order that goes in, where if you uh, so run microwaves <laughs> over uh, the regolith, over the moon dust, you can melt the moon dust into basically a solid concrete. So you can imagine using the equivalent of a microwave street sweeper to make roads, make telescope dishes, make all sorts of solid structures oh, that's just by cool. shining the right color of light on the surface. Or you could just plop down a bunch of cheap dipoles. And yeah, like well, there's really that Really low frequencies, which is what I want to do. But we're now way <laughs> too geeking, and we should probably move on to take <laughs> questions from the audience. Yeah, so we've got, about, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, I'm not sure if, if anyone is sort of short for time. Feel free to flee if you need to. Um, Alan, you're snowed in, so you're stuck with us, I think, this week. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the, it doesn't work that way, but I'll, I'll stick around for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, seriously, if, you need to, if, you need, if anyone needs to book... Uh, totally fine. We'll, we're just going to tackle a few questions from the, uh, from the comments. So, um, and I'm just going to look through the comments. So again, if you're watching this live, please plus one it so we can get a sense of how many people actually watch this thing. Um, and then if you want to ask a question for any of our guests, just post your question into the comments and then we'll look through the comments and, and grab some. Um, Right. Uh, there was one question, which I think might tear us uh, up the whole, the whole time. Uh, so Matthew Lear wanted to know, um, oh, he's been watching BBC Stargazing Live, which is a good idea. Someone should put <laughs> up telescopes live to the internet and let people watch. Um, anyway, uh, right, so that Einstein's theory of relativity breaks down in a black hole, but they didn't give any information about that. So does, so does the theory of relativity... I guess it does break down in the environments. Of the well, th there's a difference between saying something breaks down and saying the theory is incomplete. So the situation that we're in is oh. Einstein's rel theories of relativity only describe reality within uh, certain density ranges. Uh, and then they simply say, inside of this, we can't explain anything. And, and that's a limit to the theory. It doesn't break. It's a limit to the theory. And there are people working to try and extend quantum gravity, working to figure out, is our universe uh, loopy or stringy as they try and put these pieces together? So it's not broke. It's just incomplete. And there's a difference. Right. People always say, like, you know, the, what is it, the, uh, the laws of physics break down inside of a black hole, but no. we say the laws of physics, physics are doing works. just fine in the black hole. We just don't, know, just don't know them. them. Yeah, our understanding <laughs> is the problem. This is kind of the same question as, like, why do we have a lot of trouble explaining the very beginning of the Big Bang? And it's a lot of the mm -hmm. same physics where everything is so compact and there's so much energy, it's such a high density, that we don't really know what's going on because we can't uh, a good enough kind of replication of that just yet to be able to describe it yet. We need more energy in a smaller space to really study it and see what kind of things pop out and pop in and do all sorts of the crazy things that happen under those conditions. So that's why we do need to fund things like uh, these giant super colliders that may well destroy the world. But at least we get knowledge. Right. Uh, well, Brian, oh sorry, 
I was going to tackle another question. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Well, okay. I was, I was just going to say, in both black holes and the beginning of the universe, lack of observational data leads to theorists having fun and observationalists going, well, we're not sure. So until we figure out how to observe the unobservable, there will always be question marks. Uh, Ryan McGreevy asks, uh, with the recent news of fairly new Martian meteors falling in Morocco, uh, he's curious how scientists actually go about confirming that they came from Mars. Did anyone okay, write, work on this story? I, I posted it right about it on Google Plus. Oh, yeah. go ahead, John. Yeah. Um, it's kind of the same question. Is like also we have moon meteorites. We have ones from all sorts of different places. Uh, usually, you notice though they come from the outer solar system and not the inner, because when you're trying to get from like Venus to Earth, you're having to climb up that kind of gravitational well. So usually, it's easier to fall down. But the way they do it is they take a look at what gases are trapped in the rock, and then they can match it to what gases are in the atmosphere. There's kind of a unique composition for every different body. Yeah, I got this question and, on Google Plus as well when I posted about it. And, and that's exactly right. To, to be even more specific, there are little bubbles inside the rock that have gas trapped in them. And as John points out, you know, when, when, when you see a composition that looks like Mars's atmosphere, you can be pretty sure that's where it came from. And of course, right. we have and, measured Mars's atmosphere um, directly with the Viking landers um, and uh, Phoenix and Pathfinder. So we, we have direct measurements of Mars's atmosphere. And we assume that Mars's atmosphere has a pretty constant composition all around the planet, because after all, the atmosphere blows all over the planet. The rocks, however, vary in, comp in composition from place to place. So it's really valuable to have new samples from Mars in this case. We just don't, one problem, though, is that we don't know where the samples came from, which is why it's still valuable to select a site and bring back a sample from a particular selected site from a known <coughs> geologic context. Right. It, but the atmospheres don't change too much. They're kind of very stable on long time scales, unlike the Earth, where we have life and other things which are constantly changing it. We don't even have a lot of volcanic activity going on on Mars, which should be changing that. It, it's still pretty awesome that even without Phobos Grunt, we're able to get sample return missions that just cost the price of an airplane ticket to Morocco. <laughs> and the price of the meteorite. This one's going for a lot. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think they said 20 times the price of gold per ounce, roughly. Yeah, I was surprised. It was going for something like a thousand bucks a gram, and um, that is uh, that's a lot of money because a gram of this thing, you know, is a little tiny speck. But you know, me Martian meteorites go for a lot of cash, and so that's actually not a not a terrible price for a gram of Martian material. You're lucky to find that meteorite. Everyone go and start looking for meteorites. Well, Morocco is a great place. A lot of meteorites fall in north. Well, they fall all over the world, but Northwest Africa is very dry and stable, and so uh, there's there's literally tons of material that's brought back from there, and it's it's a long, complicated story. But it, it, that's where a lot of our meteorites come from. A lot of them are just unidentified. They just have NWA and then a number. I know Emily probably wouldn't like that because she just appears to not like catalog designations, and I don't blame her. Uh, but it, it's hard to keep them all straight, but there's like NWA blah 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 and NWA this. They all come from Northwest Africa because that's just a place that preserves them well. Yeah, same with Antarctica. I mean, it's just, they're easy right. to find there. It's not that they, you know, if you could, you know, search the Pacific Ocean, you'd find most yeah. of them, right? Um, okay, well, so I'm going to go back to an earlier topic we talked about. So Asayan Haynes wants to know, uh, could you simulate a huge telescope by taking images of the sky at different points as the Earth is moving around its orbit. And I see what, what, you know, the idea there is that you would take, you know, as you would move across, take each image as you move around your orbit, then in theory that would be mimicking a big, a big orbit, right? But that, that doesn't actually work. Um, we use that to measure distances to things. So that's how we make parallax measurements. Now, the issue is if you want to actually be able to combine the light in a meaningful way, you have to combine light that was emitted at the exact same time. Um, and this is where, with the VLI, VLBI systems, they actually turn the tapes on and off or start the, sim the signals at different points in time to correct for the distances between the two, obje the two telescopes and the object. Um, the, you have to get the timing exactly right to get the increase in, in, um, increase in resolution. Right. With those, those, some of those optical telescopes that do combine their, their light, the interferometers, I mean, they're it's all in the timing. That's the, that's the hard part. And, they, and they're only meters apart. 
Yeah, right. and, yeah. and it, it's a matter of the way the physics works is you have to get the waves to physically interact with one another in order to get the increased resolution. It all comes down to quantum mechanical effects, which are a bear to do the math for, um, but boil down to you have to be looking at wavelengths of light that were emitted at the same time from the object. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ian Dennison asks, would Lagrange, Lagrange points uh, not make for good locations for future long-based telescopes? They do have, uh, that's where the James Webb telescope is going to L2, so they're, they're very interested in using Lagrange points. And, and I know that there are already a couple of telescopes that have gone to Lagrange points uh, to, you know, to be in a semi-stable orbit. That's a gravitational balance point where the gravitational forces from Sun and Earth uh, balance out and you don't have to spend a whole lot of uh, effort to keep something in one place. So, yeah, they, they are taking advantage of that, and they want to take more advantage of it. But it doesn't work for interferometry. You'll have the motion problem, because you have a Lagrange point, but your telescope is still orbiting about the Lagrange point. It's much a smaller movement, but there's still movement that's bigger than the wavelength of light. But when they talk about uh, creating space-based interferometers, and in, in a sense, this is what the GRAIL mission is doing also, yeah. that they have to know very precisely where the, the different probes are. And so I guess they're getting better at that. And that's the aim, is to be able to have space-based uh, interferometers that can have that kind of precision to do those sorts of observations to see, the, to detect uh, what is going on in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, for example. And, and the way they're able to make it work is having the two telescopes line of sight where they can see each other. The problem becomes when you put the Earth in the middle and the line of sight includes a planet and it just all sort of goes to pot quickly. <laughs> but I think, you know, I mean, I think we can assume that as this, as the engineering and the techniques improve, we're going to get bigger and bigger baselines for the, these, these interferometers, these mixing of telescopes, and I'm sure they'll reach some practical limit. And I think Rick Monday wanted to know, could you do it with personal telescopes? And it's that same problem, right? If you've got two telescopes on opposite sides of the Earth, as long as you can get the timing down to the nanosecond, mm -hmm. then it's good, but you can't. So I've seen work. college students do it with, like, you know, TV satellite radio mm -hmm. telescopes that they make. Um, so in the radio, you could do it with a personal telescope. Yeah. Optical, yeah. not so much. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I think there was... Uh, so I think one last one. This will probably chew us up for a few minutes. So Bridget uh, Sheeran, I think she asked this last week, but is there much scope for, much search for non-carbon water oxygen-based life going on at all? And I think, Pamela, we talked about this on Astronomy Cast, how, how NASA has actually released guidelines for non-carbon-based processes and non, not using water as a solvent. Right? So there is so, some thinking about it. So there, there was a study done a few years ago trying to figure out uh, what alternative chemistries are most effective. So this is where you replace carbon with silicon. This is where you replace phosphor with arsenic. You basically shift things up and down the periodic table so that the way the atoms bond together stays the same. You have four electrons bonding between the two atoms. Um, but the core composition, the number of, of pro, uh, the number of protons in the centers of the atoms change. Um, in looking at the distribution of, um, well, how common is carbon? How car common is silicon? Carbon is still one of the most common elements in, in the universe, so this is where we focus our attention, but thought into what chemistry is required to create life in alternative ways is something that people are working to figure out through NASA's Astrobiology Institute. And I think with curiosity, an it's going to have... Oh, go ahead, Emily. Well, I was going to say that, that um, we shouldn't just be thinking about different um, base, like uh, carbon versus silicon. There's also the question of different solvents. And I think one yeah. of the ones that's interesting in, within our solar system is methane, because we know that there are large... Um, ocean, lakes and oceans of liquid methane on Titan, and so if, if you can have the kind of chemistry that you need to have in order to create life in other solvents, and that also is very interesting. Yeah, a couple of years ago there was a discussion of whether, uh, whether there was some sort of interesting chemistry going on 
on Titan just because they had seen the, the presence of acetylene or other substances that suggested there, was, there could have been some sort of metabolism going on. So they have it in mind, but uh, I, I guess it will be driven by experiment and, and how the astrobiologists come up with uh, alternative chemistries for life. What, what was particularly cool about the Titan result, and this is something that Chris McKay has written about if you want to Google, is we know what the chemistry of Titan should be like if it's in just plain Jane chemical equilibrium, put everything in a pot, let it evolve as a planet. We know what that should look like, and that's not what we see. What we actually see is the chemicals out of equilibrium in a way that was predicted by people trying to figure out what would the chemistry look like if there was life. Now this doesn't mean there is life, it just means there's a disequilibrium compatible with models that have life in them. So there could be other geologic processes that we haven't thought of. On the but other hand, we have to remind ourselves that Titan is a, is, it's basically, for all intents and purposes, it's a planet. It's much bigger than Mercury. It has an atmosphere. It has a climate that varies with time. It has weather. It's got the sun's ultraviolet interacting with its atmosphere in very complicated ways. So I would take with a grain of salt um, anybody saying that they've got a model that explains what Titan should look like because, I mean, you can say the same thing for Mars and, and we can't, we have difficulty explaining methane in Mars's atmosphere and, you know, it's a, it's a very large place. It's a very complex place and, and I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done observationally on Titan, maybe sending a balloon, a Montgolfier down there to float around <laughs> underneath the clouds and see what we can see on the surface, maybe bob down land, sample what we see in that particular lake, then when the the light of day strikes it again, it inflates and goes up to another place. That's my favorite, I think, mission design for a, for a Titan lander. Could you bolt on fishing rods onto the side of it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right, well, I think we, we're sort of reaching the end of our, of our hour here, so I think we'll start to wrap it up. So if anyone is, is still watching, uh, thank you. Uh, um, if you can plus one this, that would be great, because then again, that sort of gives us a nice final understanding of how many people are, are watching it. Um, we're going to do this again in theory, uh, every week at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 12 Central, 1 Eastern, and set 6 o'clock uh, London time. And so, you know, we'll, we start, we'll try to start around, around 10 if we can. Um, but again, thank you to all of the people who joined us this week. Thanks to everyone who watched. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.